Regional New South Wales is on its knees. The rivers are stopped running, the rains are no longer coming, and now our lands are burning. Given the massive amount of carbon released into the atmosphere during the recent fires, how should the government start counting and reporting on those emissions? How is it that the state government here is allowing mechanical logging of un burned forests to proceed. What do you think it will take to get the urgent, ambitious and coordinated emission reduction policies? Why is the government persisting with yet another Royal Commission? What role, if any, does Scott Morrison's faith have in influencing policy decisions around our environment and climate change? There's been a lot of reports that five volunteers and five victims have not received the support that's been promised to them. They've been left for three and a half, four weeks with absolutely no help. Why has it failed so horrendously for these people? Well, we know how much this conversation means to you, and we've been completely overwhelmed by your questions, so thank you very much. Uh, and to you here in the audience, I know a lot of you have travelled from the south coast of New South Wales. We'd planned to be in Bega tonight, but the fires mean that Queanbeyan has become the safest p option for everyone involved. So to all of you, thank you very much. Now, let's meet the panel. Cheryl McCarthy stood tall in the face of disaster in Bermagui. Also here tonight, Indigenous fire practitioner Victor Stephenson. Bigger Valley Shire Mayor, Christy McBain. Volunteer firefighter and representing the federal government, New South Wales Senator, Jim Molan. Renowned US climate scientist, Michael Mann. And state member for Bigger in New South Wales, Andrew Constance. Would you please make them all welcome? Um, I'm from Cabago. Um, we lost everything. Uh, we lost a house currently floating between Canberra and Cabago. Um, Two neighbours died, two became very close. Um, our community is really struggling with insurance, clean-up, fencing, uncertainty of financial assistance, on top of the emotional trauma of the fire itself and of individual personal loss. Uh, for our own health, we need, the community and us, need to get on with our lives, though, and that's a big issue. Um, the question really is, how can you, the panel, and the government ensure that we can get the help we need and not have government agencies intruding in our lives via various forms and pressure and all of the different bureaucracy that we're having to, to run through at the moment? Christy McBain, I know you're dealing with this daily. How do you make that happen? Um, first of all, Mr and Mrs Friedman, I'm sorry for your loss and I know we've corresponded um, via Facebook and over the phone. Um, it's really difficult because we want to help people get on with their lives. We want to make sure that it's easy for people. But there's so much that has to be done in the background. I mean, dealing with the level of uh, debris and, and asbestos contaminated debris on a whole other, other level than we've ever seen before, obviously is gonna take some time to actually get approvals in place to make sure that we can put it somewhere within our community. <clears throat> I mean, I think in the Bega Valley alone, we're talking about around 800,000 tonnes of, of debris uh, from fire. So there is gonna take some time to work through some approvals so that we can actually help people get on with their lives. But there are people that are ready to do it now and they wanna do it for themselves and they don't want anyone else involved. And I guess that's the decision that you will be able to make yourselves if you have that insurance and you have the ability to do that. But we know not everybody in our community or in other fire affected communities have that ability to assist themselves to that level as, as yet. I want to bring in Christine Morgan, who's the National Mental Health Commission CEO. She's in the audience tonight. This sort of trauma, clear trauma, compounded by people being told, we're here, we're giving you everything you need, but it not being there. Can you describe the impact of that, not just on the individual, but the community as a whole? Look, Hamish, I think the one thing that I have to say here is it would be impossible for me to find the words to describe that trauma for people. I pick up what Andrew has said. This is about real people, and I think the one thing I'd have to say is that the only thing that's okay with this is that it's not okay to be okay. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean that it is impossible to go through what anyone has in what they've seen, what they've experienced, without being absolutely whacked when it comes to emotional well-being, mental well-being. 
And I think what we're seeing here across the broad spectrum of people is that need is so individual and it is so great. And that's what we're trying to grapple with. Some people will have that immediate trauma. Other people, our stoic Aussies, will be saying, it's okay, mate, I can cope. And some people, a lot of people, <coughs> can't even find the words to express what it is they've seen. And when you have that stretching from Queensland right the way down the East Coast, through New South Wales, into Victoria, into parts of South Australia, across mass population areas, what's the compound impact of so many people experiencing that? It is an enormous compound impact. And I think if we look at it from a compounding perspective, it almost becomes too much. I think where we need to go to, and I've heard it tonight, and, and it resonates so strongly, is this is the only way we can deal with this, is to connect with each other, is for each of us to try and find one person that we can connect with. Now, that might be family, it might be friends, it might be a counsellor, it may be somebody else, um, but somehow finding within ourselves the means of being able to either put into words or some other form of communication what has happened is a first step. It doesn't solve things, but without doing that, we can't even unlock our potential to recover. Christine Morgan, thank you. Cheryl McCarthy, take me to New Year's Eve. You're in Bermagui, mm -hmm. you're the duty officer. What did you have to do? Uh, so I received a call around uh, 10 past three in the morning that uh, the fire was impacting Quorma, which is uh, nearby Bermagui, and that we needed to open the surf club uh, as an evacuation centre. So by 3.30, we were open and uh, not entirely knowing what to expect. Uh, I think by about uh, 4.20, uh, the next community received their messages to leave. By 10 to 6 in the morning, one came through to Bermagui that uh, it's too late to leave. Residents there needed to seek shelter. So uh, over those kind of first three hours, it was just people pouring into the surf club cars, people, animals uh, pouring in. And we're a town, our immediate township is around 1,600 people. And within a few hours there, we had upwards of 5,000 people um, at that centre. So it was, um, it was an intense situation. It was, uh, we have some amazing volunteers. I think one of the real challenges about that day as well is that uh, we weren't an isolated case. There were fires breaking out everywhere. So where you might, uh, in other circumstances, be able to rely on more resources being brought in quickly to help you. Uh, that just wasn't possible, it wasn't for lack of trying. And even being there at the mm -hmm. centre, it appeared to be terrifying. Oh yeah, it it was something that I would never want to uh, want to experience again. And uh, having the darkness, I remember I was waiting for the uh, sun to come up so I could get a good look at the water to see how we could launch our boats and how safe it was. And it just wasn't coming up. And finally, I looked at my watch and it was 9 a.m. And I realised this is going to stay dark. So many people I've spoken to in that community talk about you and the role you played and the leadership role that you took. Mm. They think you saved lives probably by being such a strong leader in that community at that time. Have you come to terms with that? No, um, thank you for saying that and thank you to those uh, out there who feel that. Um, we had a fantastic team. Uh, it certainly wasn't just Surf Lifesavers either. The SES on the ground with us were amazing and um, I think with the sheer numbers of people, the thing that hit me the most was our role was to keep them safe. But I, I don't know. I, I think we were just saved by the wind that day. And I hate to think, and it, uh, you know, I think about it at night sometimes, hate to think what would have happened if that wind change hadn't come. And we had those 5,000 people there with us to be safe. And um, it, it was just a, a terrible and impossible situation and the sky was red and you, you could see that fire coming towards us. You're lying awake at night imagining so, that. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I do wake up and I do think about that and I do think about the people. And it's, a, it's an amazing honour and a privilege that people um, feel that you're their safe place. And so, um, you know, we take that 
very seriously as volunteers. And, and I think it was quite an overwhelming experience to, uh, to go through that with the people. Uh, I can't tell you the number of people that have told me that they appreciate you and your work. I hope you, you have a sense of that from your own community. Thank you. Yeah, look, we, we really do feel the love um, in the community and uh, it, it's a really special area, the uh, Bermagui, Cabago, Korma area, the entire Bigger Valley and um, thank you for sharing that. But uh, the number of people, honestly, who stepped in to lend a hand that day, community members, we had the George Bass Marathon, some of them camping in town, uh, no one had to be asked. Andrew Constance, You've spoken about <coughs> mental health and the impacts this has had on you. Will your life be the same after this? No. Never. I, I, um, I think um, being taken away from your family when you're going through it is tough, but, um, you know, I, I saw something that day which I was never, ever expecting to experience. I've seen bushfires at the farm as a kid. Um, so the spot across our countryside, but not like this. Um, and I, I left home having poured 5,000 litres on the house, thinking it's gone. I'll get down to Malua Bay Beach. I probably left a little bit too late. Um, we got encircled by fire on that beach with 1,000 people in the surf life-saving movement, um, some off-duty police and fireys. Um, young Anthony Bellet, who has the coolest mind that I've ever struck in the surf life-saving movement, got a couple of hundred people out with Peter and a number of those surf lifesavers out of that clubhouse as the fire headed our way at pace. Um, when I took off from home, um, I could hear it. Um, the, the power of the, the heat wave off it, I thought I was going to melt. When I got in the car, the car gauge was at 58 degrees and it wasn't going south. And, um, you know... I just don't know how we didn't lose hundreds of people there. And, and, and to Hamish, to your point about mental health, I'm the first to put my hand up. I've cried, I've been hugged, been loved, um, but the trauma of this is so profound and it's affecting thousands of people across our regions and we need help. And I mean, this is why today... I, I, I Andrew, have you had help yet? I've had a couple of phone calls from people. I've certainly had my colleagues, in some cases, r running around saying they're worried about me. But I'm drawing strength from my neighbours and, and Jen and the kids. Um, yeah, I'm going to need proper counselling. I'm going to need, absolutely, Hamish, I'm going to need proper counselling. And that's why I've been vocal about this. I mean, males in particular hide this up and bottle it up. Um, and, you know, I've had farmers cry. Um, I had a mate today cry as he was waiting for the fire to come to his place this morning. Um, you know, I, I just, I think out of this, I mean, we've got this multifaceted mental health approach here. Um, one of the reasons I called for, for donations to be made to Lifeline today if people want to help with bushfire affected communities is they're the only service at 2am and 3am where people are awake thinking about this, going over and over in their own heads. So I'm, you know, look, I, I don't want to see off the back of this people self-harming. I don't want to see any more pain than we have to go through. And, you know, the spirit that we're drawing from each other is very important. This is what I'm talking about of the community. Mm -hmm. But, you know, pretty much every second, third night we've been having beers in the lane at home with, with my neighbour um, just to get through it. And to Andrew's point, uh, if you or anyone you know... If anyone you know or you are experiencing difficulties, please call the numbers that are on your screen right now. Isn't it time that the leaders of our country, both political leaders and some emergency services leaders, recognise the special knowledge of First Nations communities, especially in the area of their fire-burning practices? And I think we have a question on a similar theme from a gentleman two seats along from you, Uncle Nook, he's known as at Sussex Inlet, uh, Noel Webster. Hi, hi Amish. Um, all we see now is a um, short-term answer for long-term response. I put forward what action, not a policy, not a strategy, but what action are you going to implement to see long-term recovery 
of our landscape, health and our communities. Victor Stephenson. Well, well Nooks is um, one of the communities that we've been working with and mentoring. Um, with, teaching um, them traditional teaching practices. Teaching traditional practices and reading landscapes. And the fact of the matter is, is that we don't have the expertise for, um, in um, the current land management sectors to look after the landscape the right way. Because, you know, we're, we're with a landscape now that's just full of fuel. And, and it was just backed up to the communities. And, you know, we've been saying, you know, you, you talk about climate change, um, ringing the climate bells. You know, I've seen elders ringing the, uh, the bells of, um, for this happening for a long time now, even longer than, you know, 20 years or more. And we've seen it on TV year after year, watching the, the, the everything burning down south here. And even up north, we get the similar fires. And we need to start training people to read landscapes, understand the soils, um, understand when to burn the right ecosystem at the right time. And we're also facing a different um, time now where we have vegetation that doesn't belong to this country. So we have um, lantana and other weeds, but we also have flammable natives that don't belong in certain ecosystems that come out of uh, um, uh, ecosystems that don't have fire, which is a very flammable plants. And when we burn the incorrect way of, say, if we just do hazard reduction and say, like, let's get rid of the fuel, um, a lot of the times, um, a lot of those programs burn too hot on the soil. And what we get is these invasive um, natives coming up that are so flammable, and we don't get the right vegetation in the right ecosystems, which depend on the right fires. And that is science. Could, could things be different now if we followed these practices? If we follow these practices, it's going to provide hope. And it's going to provide training. You know, I'm talking three-year training programs, you know, and we have Aboriginal communities all over Australia that are willing to help. Practitioners. Can, can, can you explain, though, what we should be doing differently, practically? Because the Prime Minister says that he is open to hearing about traditional practices when it comes to land management. What would you say to the authorities that we could do ahead of next summer? I would say dump it in the passenger seat and let us drive for a change. <laughs> and, and when you're in the passenger seat of the car, that means we don't leave you behind. And it's just too often that we're never even in the passenger seat and we get left behind all the time. And it's just, just once in this nation's history, can you just listen to Aboriginal people, a knowledge system? You know, there's an intelligence there and we, we have all this information for looking after the environment and we're not being tapped into. And it's so frustrating. The Christmas break was by no means a holiday. I was evacuated, I fought fires, and I was anxious for my father, my home, and my fellow RFS volunteers. I constantly questioned whether I was doing enough. We've been breathing this smoke for the past month with no confirmation of blue skies or any significant amounts of rain in the near future. In light of my experiences, my question to the panel is, is this what young people and the whole community now have to prepare for as the new normal? Michael Mann. Well, uh, I wish I could say it, it's, it's just a new normal. In other words, we just have to figure out how to cope with the conditions that uh, now exist. Uh, unfortunately, it's worse than that. Um, a new normal is if we act on this problem, if we bring down carbon emissions dramatically, and that means Australia working with uh, all the other nations of the world to accomplish that, and, and this is one of the themes that's emerged tonight, the importance of cooperation, people working together and living sustainably on the land. Uh, we need to work together to live sustainably on this planet, and Australia plays a critical role in doing that. Um, if we act, if we bring our carbon emissions down by a factor of two within the next 10 years, which we can do if all partners work together, um, then we can avoid the worst impacts of climate change. We're still going to have to deal with elevated risk, and we're going to have to use all the tools available to us when it comes to adaptation and when it comes to I increased resiliency. We're going to need to draw on all those tools, but we can prevent it from getting worse. On the other hand, if we don't act now, uh, look, Australia, this is, a, this is a message to the rest of the world. Climate change has arrived. Dangerous climate change has arrived now. How bad are we willing to let it get? And yes. Can I, just, can I just ask you, though, before we move on to address this question, because politically there is contest over this, which is the link between what we are seeing right now 
and climate change. What is your scientific view? Uh, my view is the, is the view of the world scientific community, every scientific institution in the world that's weighed in on this matter. Climate change is real, it's human caused, it's already leading to disastrous I impacts here in Australia and around the rest of the world, and it will get much worse if we don't act. Jim Mullen, do you accept that scientific view? I certainly accept that the, the climate is changing. It has changed and it will change, and what it's producing is hotter, and drier uh, 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 weather and a hotter and drier uh, com uh, country. Uh, and what's causing that? Uh, as to whether it is uh, human-induced climate change <laughs> is... <laughs> thank you, thank you. As to whether it is human-induced climate change, my mind is open. But this well, is... This what, what, is, can, can, can this I, is we just... Come on, we could... Let's just... This, uh, is, this, is, this, not, this is not the key question. The key question is, what are you going to do about it? I, I'm sorry, Senator, but, but that was my question, yeah. is what you think is causing it. Why is your mind open? Because, because the, the, uh, Michael might say that the, uh, the uh, science is settled, uh, and I respect, very much respect, scientific opinion, but uh, every day across my desk comes enough information for me to say that there are other opinions. So, so what, what is that information? What's the actual information you have? Oh, I, 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 see, I see so much that, I, I, you know, I'm, not, I, I'm a very practical man, Hamish. I'm going to get out there and do things, which, see, the one thing that... that Sorry, we so, but could you no, hang on, wait, wait, wait till I answer. What's the actual... The no, one thing Senator, that I agree the with, Hamish... No, the, what's the information? The one thing that I, you've the seen one that thing that I agree with, Michael, is that... Um, Climate change uh, and our policies in relation to climate change are designed to mitigate the risk. Uh, it's very difficult to mitigate the risk. You can go back and look for the last 100 years how or why it started. If we can't mitigate risk, then we've got to adapt. And that's the key to what but we're doing. S and Senator, we I'm are sorry, but you, you haven't answered the question, which mm. is you, you said you get information across your desk every day yes. which leads you to doubt or be open minded about the science. Yes, I am what open minded. What is that about information? It. Oh, it's, a, it's a range of information which goes... It's, it's a range of... Thank you. But, but, sorry, it's, can we it's, just respectfully listen to this? Yeah, thank I'm you. just trying to get to the bottom of this. What is, what is the evidence that you are relying on? I'm not on? relying on evidence, Hamish. I am saying... <laughs> you said it. You yeah, said no, it. But, but, you said it. But, but this, is, this is why my mind is open. I would love to be convinced one way or the other, well, but to be prudent, what the government is doing is it's got a climate uh, uh, and emissions reduction policy. And it is a good policy, and it will mitigate risk to the maximum that it can, and where risk cannot be mitigated, it will, it will adapt. And, and that's what we've got to work on, is the adaptation. Yeah, no, come on now, mate. Um, <laughs> and, and, and he's an American. Now, um, you know, you should keep an open mind, mm. but not so open that your brain falls out. <laughs> when, it come, <laughs> when it comes to this issue, when it comes to human-caused climate change, it's literally the consensus of the world's scientists that it's caused by human activity. Now, you sometimes hear the talking point from contrarians from the yeah. Murdoch media um, Michael, Matt, can that, I, that it, maybe it's natural. Can, natural can factors up, would be though. pushing us in the opposite direction Let, right now. Let's try not to make this personal. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah. we're into name calling already, Michael. And, well done. And, well, can no, I, I didn't, address, I didn't can I just call your name. Raise the point, point about open minded. This is a democratically elected yeah. government. They went to uh, the electorate with the policies that they have in place now, and they were voted for. And this right. government has been elected in multiple times. Clearly, there are a lot of Australians that are happy with the policy <laughs> settings uh, that may agree, in fact, with Jim Mullen's scepticism, open mindedness about the science. Yeah. Are you saying to all of them that their brains have fallen out? No, what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, being open-minded is, is, is a great thing. Uh, skepticism is an important thing in science, but it has to be skepticism on both sides. It can't be one-sided skepticism where you're literally oh, absolutely rejecting absolutely. the overwhelming absolutely. evidence based on the flimsiest of ideas uh, that you can't even no, define. Yeah. Um, uh, Can I just bring it back to Serena's question? Oh, well done, yeah. Serena's question was, is this the new norm? Geez, I hope not. Serena lives in Brogo, a heavily timbered area in the Bega Valley. Her parents, and she's got a number of brothers and sisters, 
She's a smart, intelligent, capable young woman who is now the school captain of Bega High. And we have fabulous school kids right across the Bega Valley. Her point is, what is going to change into the future for us? And what I see constantly is this generational debate or a, a political partisan debate on climate change. Most people I speak to are over it. Absolutely. They don't care what one says and what the other one doesn't say, or the sky's blue, no, it's pale blue. Nobody cares. It's now about what are the actions going to be, how do we mitigate, how do we adapt, how do we make ourselves resilient as communities to Absolutely. it? Because yep. what I don't want to see after a tragedy of this scale is for a second wave of disaster to come, and that is people leaving regional communities because there are no jobs left. Yep. There is no economy available. Well, and back to Melissa's question earlier. This brings it back Melissa, to the your question earlier about you being affected, your business being affected. Everybody up and down the, the East Coast can relate to you because we have evacuated 90,000 tourists from an area. There are flame-impacted businesses and there are flame-impacted farms and there are flame-impacted industries, but there is not one person that isn't affected by this disaster that's unfolded. That's every business, every industry, every individual. And unless there is direct business and wage support into this area, we will see people leave because they'll need to make money. And if that happens, the heartbeat of small communities dies. We can't have that.